I am Jim Collison, and this is Gallup's Call to Coach, recorded on November 29th, 2023. Call to Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches. Share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, we'd love to have you join us in the chat room. There could be links above or below. If you have questions, just drop them in the chat. We're, we are monitoring those. If you have questions after the fact, you can always send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to, to subscribe right there on your favorite podcast app or right there on YouTube so you never miss an episode. Lauren Hunter is our host today. Lauren is a key account leader with Gallup and her top five are developer positivity, arranger, responsibility, and individualization. Lauren, great to be back with you. Welcome back to Call the Coach. Thank you so much, Jim. I am so excited to be here, and I am thrilled to have our guest, Vicki Nelson, here with us this morning as well. Um, Vicki is the Vice President of Shared Services at Election Systems and Software, and I've had the privilege of partnering with her and getting to know her actually super closely over the last year. Um, and Election Systems' mission is to really provide valuable, trusted, and proven election systems and services to our nation's elected administrators. So, Vicki, welcome. Welcome. Um, we're so excited to have you here this morning. Uh, Lauren, thank you. And Jim, thank you. I am very excited uh, to be here to talk about this company that, that I work for and all of the great things that we're doing um, alongside with Gallup. So thank you for uh, including me. Yeah, no, absolutely. We're, we're so excited too. It's going to be a, a great conversation here today. And, you know, Jim and I read your bio and there's so many fantastic insights that we're seeing in your bio and your strengths. I'd love for you to just recap for the audience a little bit about yourself and make sure you include, I mean, some, some, some of that fun stuff about yourself just personally as well to kind of recap it for the crew. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, Lauren, as you said, right now I'm Vice President of Shared Services um, and I've been with election systems and software. I'm going to abbreviate it as ESNS. It's just much easier to say. Uh, but ESNS, I've been here almost 10 years. And prior to that, I, I think of myself as kind of a, a mutt, um, having lots of different experiences over the, over the years of my career that have brought me here to ESNS and have kind of helped the success that we're having here. Um, I had the unique opportunity to work for Gallup for nine years um, before coming to ESNS. And prior to that, I owned two of my own businesses. Um, you're gonna laugh, but I owned a, a chain of day spas and tanning salons. <laughs> you know, the good old American dream of owning your own business. And I decided to have uh, tanning salons. Um, and I also owned a marketing business. And prior to that, I've worked in marketing, uh, worked in operations. I was COO for a medical supply manufacturing company. And again, all of those experiences have really led me here to ESNS to be a strategic partner and to help us think about how we do business better here. So, and then for fun, um, I'm a grandma uh, of two uh Beautiful grandchildren, a mother to two. I love sports. Um, you're going to laugh, but I uh, got scuba certified this year um, wow. and also took up roller skating. That oh is, my gosh. yes, very unusual. Um, but I do like to have fun outside of work as well. I love that. I can I can actually hear your strengths coming out and everything that you just said from your personal, you know, experiences and owning your own business and and whatnot yeah. to your just your personal life and roller skating. By the way, I mean, if you could teach me any tips out after this podcast, please let me know because that is not a I do not have um, that in my top five strengths by any means. <laughs> wear knee pads, uh, Lauren. Just wear knee pads. Thank you. Yeah, everybody, please take that. You take that as a key takeaway here from us this morning. <laughs> and um, elbow pads, yeah. Right. Vicki, I'd love for you to also share. I mean, it's it's so interesting with your background that you worked at Gallup as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to share a little bit with the audience about what your top five strengths are and how those have really helped you in your background and then, of course, in your role at ESNS today as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, my my number one strength, my, my top five are maximizer, futuristic, 
a strategic uh, arranger. I mean, I've got those in the right order, arrange them in the right order, but they're, and then last one is selfish uh, assurance. And, you know, when I first saw my strengths at Maximizer, I, I looked at the, the, probably the basement side of Maximizer, and that is, you know, constantly going and, and striving. And what I've learned, what Maximizer and Futuristic and Strategic have allowed me to do is to really help our organization think about how to be better, how to, how to think in the future about what, what we want to do now, and then how do we achieve it? And how do we constantly strive for doing great things? And, and I think about my role, not doing it myself, but doing it through our human capital. I think that's what allowed me to be successful here because our greatest tool at ESNS is not just our product, it's not our customers, but it is our people. The people that we have here is who makes us successful. And so my role as a as, um, leader in human resources is to help guide our leaders and our managers to think about how to best um, find the right people, how to put the right people in the right places, how to maximize, you know, get the greatest output from people. Uh, and, and so I feel I'm really I feel very lucky to have Maximizer and Futuristic and Strategic all in the same package because I think that's what's um, allowed us to be successful. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I love what you said. Our, I, I wrote it down, actually. You know, I don't think of me as doing this myself, but it's our human capital and your people are your greatest strength. And I, I just love kind of you sharing that and articulating how your futuristic has helped you get there and your maximizer, you know, has really helped you in that way as well. Yeah. Um, you, we'd be really curious, you know, when we're thinking about strengths and your people and how you've used them personally, both in your past life and then of course here at ESNS as well in your current career. Um, what what does the organization look like at ESNS from a strengths perspective? Does everybody, you know, kind of know their strengths? How is your culture being set up around that? Well I'm gonna give you, if you don't mind, I'm gonna give us a little bit of a history lesson of when I, I started that. nine years ago and get us to the point in where we are today. You know, we have, we're the leader in, in our industry and have been the leader in our industry for many years. So we're successful. We've been successful. Um, we continue to be successful. But when I came in nine years ago, there's a couple of things that um, I observed about our organization. And the first thing is we're a scrappy little company. You know, we're not very many people knew, know or knew about ESNS. We kind of flew under the radar uh, we're an organization of 450 people, you know, across the United States, get a lot done with not a lot of people. And what's really cool is that they're just really hard workers here. People work so hard and they have a mission for the work we did and do. And so when I came in nine and a half years ago, the, um, the, what I started was how do we begin to articulate why we are successful and how do we begin to put a formula together for how we replicate and sustain that success? And so it really started with how, articulating who do we want to work for the company, not just the skills and knowledge we need somebody to bring to the table, but what are those kind of innate and intangible things that we want that that make us successful and continue to support our culture. So that's where we brought in the Gallup talent assessments to help us think about what does what does a successful employee look like and how can we continue to replicate that? How can we continue to to uh, hit more home runs um, it, you know versus just singles? And so we brought the, the Gallup talent assessment in. I will tell you, and I can tell you stories about that later, but that has been, it is just a part of who we are today. Then kind of organically, Lauren, we introduced the language of strengths. So once we identified 
who, who, what does a successful employee look like at ESNS? What are those intangible things? How can we begin to use data to find that person? Once we, once we got that down, then we wanted to articulate how do people work? How do, everybody's an individual. So how do individuals work and how can we kind of lasso that and learn about that? And so organically, we introduced strengths about five years ago. And when I say organically, what I've learned about our company is when you tell them that they need to do something, there's less, there's less desire to do it. <laughs> <laughs> then when you allow them to figure it out and start to use it and start to get comfortable with it and we start to get some momentum and that's exactly what we did mm. is people started to, you know, do their top 34 and then in team meetings they would talk about their strengths and then other people would get interested about what it is. And so now it is a framework for how managers learn about who their employees are and how to best manage them. So every new person that comes to ESNS within the first five days takes their strengths finder. Um, every team in a team meeting will bring out a team's strengths. And so I think as we stand today, we have probably about 75 to 80 percent of our employees that utilize their strengths the language of strengths on a regular basis, both in team calls, individual coaching calls. It's just a natural part of how people speak about who they are and what they bring to the table. Vicki, I love what you said about allowing it to be kind of organic. It kind of reminds me of my 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 own granddaughters. And we we when we want them to do something, we tell them not to. We're like, <laughs> definitely, I don't want to hug before you go. Just go. I'm not interested, right? And, they, they come. and while that's a silly example, I, I do think there is some, I think sometimes in a, in a, we take a strengths-based approach to some things. I, I hear this from the community all the time is, how do I mandate this so everybody does it? But you're kind of, you kind of came out and say, no, I want them to come at it from an organic, using your word, or a more natural approach, or maybe I would use the word desire, right? They desire to, to they come yeah. to you and say, hey, how do we implement this in our teams to make this better? Is that, do you do, is that kind of the way it works as folks are coming in and saying, no, 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 I want to implement this. How do I do it? Can you yes. talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, we, we've learned our lessons. I, I have mandated things before, you know, we had an organizational development group that mandated learning and mandated, you know, these, these tools that managers have to use. And, you know, like your granddaughters, they're, you know, they know best, they don't want to use that stuff. Um, to my job is not to do the work for them, but is to help managers learn how to be successful and, and provide the tools that they can use to be successful and to have successful teams. And what I'm finding is by the, the, you know, providing them choices. My kids were always better with choices. Do you want choice A or choice B? Um, by providing choices about tools that are available, managers get to choose the things that work for them. And so, what I'm finding is that, you know, the desire of, you know, utilizing the Gallup Talent Assessment, as I mentioned before, it is just a part of who we are anymore. There isn't a candidate that gets interviewed without having gone through the talent assessment. And it's not because we're mandating it. It's because, <laughs> true story, man I, many managers will say to me, well, when I don't use it, it comes back and bites me in the butt. Mm. Or when I when I don't pay attention to it, I can come back later and go, mm, you know what? I sh I knew that. I knew that from the information from the from the the talent assessment. I learned that and I ignored it. And so because because now they know it's just an important part of a decision that they get to make, and they want to make good decisions. 
I love, Vicki, that you're kind of expressing this organic way where we're helping people make decisions. I mean, that's what's going to make it part of your culture. And that's that's where in the last nine years, you know, where you've been able to get ESNS where it is now. You mentioned that within the first five days that people start, they normally take their strengths. Is that right? The first it is. Days? Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Yep. Would, it's a part of the onboarding process. I was going to say, could you share a little bit more kind of about what that onboarding process looks like? You know, so people go through the Gallup talent assessment and then they're getting onboarded at ESNS. What What do strengths look like? Are they just taking the assessment? Are they going through any sort of development or coaching sessions with their manager in that onboarding process? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a great question. And, and Lauren, this is, um, you know, part of the lesson I've learned is is, you know, introducing things at, at a time, you know, after people get comfortable with it and, you know, continue to introduce new things or new opportunities or new choices down the road. And, and what I mean by that is when an individual is hired, mm-hmm. um, within the first, the uh, first two weeks of actually being hired and receiving their, their uh, offer letter, They have two or three touch points, and those two or three touch points are both from the human resource team that's welcoming them to the uh, to ESNS and providing them, you know, all of the the links to the things they need to do beforehand, all those legal E's that we need to cross our T's and dot our I's, and then a you know expectation for what the first, second, and third day is going to look like, and then there's a touch point from their manager. They are, and once they are onboarded that very first day, um, they are, human resources has them for about three hours. And within that three hours, you know, they we go through the benefit, they go through the benefits. They, where's the bathroom? Where is my, where's my seat going to be? And <laughs> we'd like for you to go through the strengths finder um, and provide them that link that then is sent to their manager within the first five days. The expectation, Lauren, is that the managers will sit down with them and go through their strengths. Um, and and what, I, what we hope to do is continue to provide education for managers about how to you know, better explain the strengths, uh, be able to use that you know, more often in onboarding a new hire, you know, and our, and our managers through the boss to coach platform are learning how to do that. And so we'll get better at that and we'll get, we'll get again, so that it's more organic and ingrained in what managers do with new hires um, as they get more comfortable with it. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And, and I'm excited to explore a little bit more, too, about how you all are leveraging BASA Coach is really one of those key development strategies for managers to do exactly what you just mentioned. You know, how can we have more intentional conversations about what people do best and, you know, how is yeah. that uh, helping in their role? Um I'd be really curious too. So you mentioned, you know, nine years ago when you started at ESNS that these were all your maximizer, your futuristic, they were kicking in and we're like, how could we continue to change the culture with 450 employees across the U.S.? You know, what can we can, can continue to do? I would just be curious looking back, what kind of challenges did ESNS have as an organization, you know, five to nine years ago that you feel like have really kind of been resolved with a few of these focus areas from talent-based assessments to building a strengths-based culture to building high-performing managers? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's there's two challenges that I recognized right from the very beginning. And the first one was the role of human resources. The, the role of human resources was very functional you know, from getting your benefits, managing your benefits to policies and procedures and um, payroll, very functional things that are extremely important, very important. They're the foundation, you know, to, to keep us keep us in line. Um, but they're not they're not what I wanted our human resource group to be. I wanted our human resource group to be partners with our managers and our employees that helps them make good decisions about their human capital. And that, man, that was an uphill battle for, I would say, probably three or four years to try to prove to people that human resources are not the policy police, that our human resources was not the policy police. 
um, and that we were their partners. And, and the second challenge was to have managers own their role in, in the success of our human capital. That it wasn't, okay, human resources, what do I do now? It was myself and my team coaching managers to say, what are your challenges? What are, you, what are the choices and the tools you have to make good decisions? What kind of decision would you like to make? What are the consequences if you make this decision? And so we shifted the role of re human resources to be the, the we're going to tell you what to do to we're going to help you make good decisions. And that's allowed human our HR team to um, put the accountability and the responsibility back on managers to realize that the power is in their hands to make decisions about their employees. And it seems really simple, but it it's not, it wasn't. And again, it took us like probably three, four, five years to finally to get managers go, oh, I own that, you're right. You know what, here's what I wanna do. And the, the tools that we brought in from the talent assessment to the strengths, to the boss to coach um, are all tools to help managers make good decisions. And so I feel like we've been successful in shifting that mindset to managers owning the outcomes. Mm. Vicki, I love that. You, you've you said, we've said, we've alluded to this a, a couple times, this talent-based hiring, right? And we talk about it some on Call to Coach, not a lot. There may be some folks kind of wondering, and it was, we should probably just get this kind of out, out, out in the open. We, you, your organization has partnered with us to build a talent assessment that you actually have people take prior to joining the organization, right? That gives you some oh. information about that. Can you, can you talk a little bit about in that partnership, that is something now it's not a public product that we sell yet, maybe, maybe someday in the future, but can you talk a little bit about the partnership and why that's important to you and how that continues to set you up post, you know, once it doesn't end just in the hiring process, right? That sets you up for the the future as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, 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 I sure can. Well, I, again, we do things really simple here and and because simple works um, and simple is re replicatable and sustainable for us. And the partnership that we have is we use this model from Gallup that is a very simple model and it's from attraction to recruiting and hiring to onboarding to engaging and then developing and retaining. And that is a physical model that we use from Gallup um, that, that helps us uh, manage our employee experience. And within each of those, those, those uh, modules or each of those steps in this yeah. model, there are tools and engagement that we use with Gallup to help us in, you know, better attracting and hiring the right person. And Gallup has been very instrumental in helping us think about what is the right talent assessment that we use for our jobs, our specific roles, and helping, helping coach us to using it in the right way. And then how do we use that tool, that information after someone is hired? And how do we continue to use that tool in the engaging and the retaining and development uh, phase of the employee experience? Um, same thing with the, with the strengths, um, helping us think about the, the, the onboarding and the engaging and the retaining components of the employee experience with our, with our, our strengths model and then the development piece with our managers and boss to coach. So they aren't just programs, they're all very succinct, intentional tools that we use to, to you know, grow this, grow and enhance the employee experience for both our employees and our managers. Definitely. And it's so neat to, to hear, Vicki, how throughout the employee experience, you know, every 
every piece of this development is able to be kind of tied up to here's how we onboard here's how we're going to engage retain and help with performance and one of the key pieces of course of your strategy is when when people are being hired we're making sure that there's that talent fit for both the per, the perception of that employee feeling engaged in their job but also a fit to culture and that's what's so important and you know that's conversations that you have you and i have had together a lot about it's important that um, it's good for the employee and the organization you know it kind of goes too far old. Yes. Um, yeah. What one of the the key pieces of that employee experience kind of as we break that into phases for ESNS, I know when we kind of look at that engaging and performing piece is boss to coach, right, for your managers and them going through that development program. I'd love for you to just share a little bit more about what that what the boss to coach program looks like at ESNS and yeah. um, you know, your managers that have gone through that, how that's kind of changed the landscape at mm. ESNS. It's really been transformational. You know, I can point to multiple things that we've done um, that have been transformational. You know, the talent-based um, assessments, talent-based hiring has been transformational. This, uh, this transition to boss to coach, you know, prior to this, our managers, we have really, we have great managers and there, we were transitioning from a manager's role of, you know, telling people what kind of work to do, how to do the work, um, kind of a functional functional direction to the manager owning the, the relationship and the conversation with an employee. And so we introduced Boss to Coach, gosh, what, two years ago, Lauren? Yep, about two years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have had two cohorts, so two separate groups that have gone through Boss to Coach. One group has gone through Boss to Coach one and two. Mm -hmm. um, one has gone through just Boss to Coach one. And because we're entering an election year, we have a group of managers that have not gone through Boss to Coach at all. And there are some both qualitative and qualitative, quantitative and qualitative things that have come from this introduction of boss to coach. One is managers, you know, just coming out of that program who say, wow, this is going to change the dialogue that I have with my employees. It's going to, now I know that I've got to become more invested in the relationship I have with my manager, with my employees. Not just, hey, I need to make sure the work gets done, but in order for me to make sure that I'm getting the best out of people, I need to invest in that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so we hear managers say that, that have gone through the boss to coach one and the boss to coach two. We collect data, we're huge data nerds here, and we collect a lot of data. And we collect data, again, to help guide us on whether we're doing the right thing. And one of the things, Lauren, that I've shared with you is on our engagement survey, we've looked at the engagement of teams for, or we've looked at the engagement for teams that have, their managers have gone through boss to coach one and two. We've looked at the engagement of teams where they've gone through boss to coach one. And we've looked at those who haven't gone through, and there are huge differences and, you know, just a couple differences. Uh, one of the questions we ask is, um, I uh, had a meaningful annual performance review. That seems like a very benign question, but there are 20 points difference between the teams that have gone through, their managers have gone through Boss to Coach 2 and those who have not gone through at all. But I think wow. it has a lot to do with the quality of the conversations and the, the ownership that the manager has in the investment of that relationship. They understand the importance of it. Um, you know, we, my opinions count. There is almost a 30 point difference between managers wow. that have gone through boss to coach one and two and those who have not, the managers haven't gone. Those are huge. Those are huge differences. But they also, when you, you've got a higher engaged team, we see this, they're more productive. And right. so those differences aren't just great to see, and we're glad that our employees get to feel the difference. But for us as a business, we know that it, it makes a difference in, in our products, it makes a difference to our customers, and it makes a difference to our financial growth and profits. 
Absolutely. That is fascinating. I, and I know you've actually shown me these these slides uh -huh. before a couple of times, Vicki, and we, we kind of geek out together when we're looking at this data to see, <laughs> you know, yes. these intentional strategies that you're putting together, they really are making a difference in your culture and your data, but also to your point, you know, these really important financial metrics that you have as a company. Um, I'd be really curious to know too, just as we're thinking about the data and some of these metrics, what are you seeing too from a cultural perspective? So with your managers that have gone through Boss to Coach, let's just kind of pick on that group versus the people that have gone through half the journey versus those managers that have gone through nothing. Do you have any real life examples or stories of what you're seeing as well kind of data aside i do i have some great stories i have one well one this is my favorite story so about a year and a half ago we hired um oh, two years ago we hired a new manager for our proposals team and this is a team of four five five proposal managers they're extremely important to our business we respond to hundreds of proposals or rfps every year and so they're a very vital piece to our business. And it's just a very high stress, very high stress role. And we hired a brand brand new, she's never managed before. Um, and the first year was pretty tough. It was pretty mm -hmm. tough for her. You know, she was trying to get her feet on the ground. She was trying to uh, transition from being a proposal uh, writer to now being a manager of the proposal team. And yeah. we had her go through boss to coach one. And when she walked out of there, she said, oh, my God, I've done it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> she wow. said, I've been telling people how to do the work. And what I need to do is I need to engage my team on how we get work done. And understanding that there, it's made, our team is made of four very indiv unique individuals that all have opinions. And so um, her team had very high turnover when she first started. And the turnover you know, uh, eased off a little bit after she went through boss to coach one. Um, and then she went through boss to coach two and boss to coach two is really about the application in increasing, you know, high performing teams and having critical conversations. And she has a team of just ro absolute rock stars. But what they said in our engagement conversation a couple months ago is it, feels different to be on this team because wow. Lindsay, the proposal manager, or the manager of proposals, lets us have a voice. We have wow. a voice in how work gets done. We have a voice. I feel like I, this is what the, the individual employee said, I feel like I have a stake in the game that I know that I am an important part, but I have a voice. And to me, if our, all of our employees feel that way, um, what a cool place that would be to come to work where oh you feel gosh, like your yeah. voice counts, where you feel like you're heard, like, you know, you're, you're an individual that makes a difference. And a lot of that is just because of the way Lindsay changed the conversation she was having with her employees. And she was, she was helping them do their job better, not telling them what to do. That's my favorite wow. story. A absolute favorite story it kind of gives me chills um, like, when I think about, um, you know, the difference she made in the lives of those people on the team. Oh, it gave me chills too, honestly, when you were saying that, because that's, you know, that's really what we want is for people to feel like they do have a voice. And Vicky, I think the coolest part about that is it has a really good bridge back to what you were saying at the very beginning when you started at ESNS. You were like, you know, we don't want to just tell people what to do. We, <laughs> you know, we as HR, we want to be their partner. And I, to me, what I'm hearing is this really common thread in your culture. And even just from working with you, and I know this, is that that is what your culture at ESNS is really built upon is powerful partnerships and ensuring that people have yeah. a voice. Um, yeah. yeah. So hearing that story is fascinating. <laughs> Here's another great story that's come out of Boss to Coach, but it's also come out of this conversation around strengths and not just the strengths as it's defined by Gallup. That's definitely an important part of it, but it's also understanding what, what does somebody just do really, really well? How do they do it? How do they operate? How do they show up to work? And one of the changes that we have really made here is the interdepartmental um, 
uh, movement of people. And what I mean by that is if someone starts in a role, like in a customer service role, and maybe, you know, they're not, they're not liking the job or it's, you know, it's not quite in line with, with how they best show up to work. Our managers do a really good job of looking across the organization to say, you know what, is there another place that this person can fit? And so we now have a very robust <laughs> stream of people that be, will be moving, um, you know, from one department or one team to another division um, because it's a better use of their talents. It's a better use of their skills. Um, and we keep people, here's some data for those data nerds like me, our average length of service is 10 years wow. um, in a technology company. I, I think that's very successful because we try to retain people, not just because, you know, we don't want people to turn over, but we want people to be productive and successful. And we do work really hard to, to try to do that so that the employee is in the right place. And if it's not where they currently are, it could be in some other, other team. I think that oh, wow. is another success we've had. It definitely is another success that you've had. I mean, 10 years in these technology roles, especially in today's workplace, um, that is almost unheard of. So that is yeah. absolutely something to celebrate. And, you know, you, you bring up this good point. You're kind of bridging between boss to coach and strengths and how that's and talent. I mean, that's kind of the perfect it's, hey, they're a culture fit, but maybe this role isn't quite a fit to what's driving them the most as an individual um, with boss to coach, you know, managers, one of the fundamental for the audience pieces of the Boston coach journey is for managers to learn how to coach to people's strengths and how yeah. to have really, you know, more impactful coaching conversations. Do you have any examples of that, Vicki, as well, of just where you've seen from like in that, even in that onboarding coaching that you have that expectation for managers to have coaching conversations? Um, has Boston coach helped in, in that way as well? Oh, oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Significantly, Lauren. Um, you know, the, it, one is, yeah, I, I feel like I'm, I'm oversimplifying this, but it, it gives, it's given managers kind of a framework for what makes up a good conversation. What should the elements of that be? So whether it's onboarding someone to a new role or whether it's having a performance conversation or whether it's offboarding someone, um, it's given them kind of the control of what that conversation can look like and feel like. And, right. uh, you know, no, no matter whether it's talking to your peer, you know, across the team or whether it's, you know, it's uh, uh, having a very difficult call, uh, it's given a framework for managers to feel confident about being able to have those sorts of conversations. That's that's amazing. Yeah, the framework is so important, you know, because I, I love yeah. your story that you shared about uh, Lindsay, I believe was her name, you know, and how it, when you're stepping into a management role, it can be challenging. And oftentimes it's viewed as, oh, this is going to be easy. This is great. And then you start to work with people. And it's this question of how can I actually properly engage them? So I, I love the framework. Um, one of the things, Vicki, that I think is really neat that you do at ESNS is when everybody comes to Gallup for Boss to Coach, you're always right here with them. And I think that's really neat as, as a leader is to kind of be kicking it off. Tell us a little bit more about what you say to these people that are going through Boss to Coach and, and how your role as a leader is so important because you're with them every step of the way. Yeah. And to me, that's inspiring when we go back to that powerful partnership piece. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's probably one of my favorite things to do because it, it goes back to uh, empowering these managers to feel like they are in control of their role and that they are in control of the outcomes of their teams. And that really at the end of the day, it's, it, it comes down to them. And what I say to them, you know, every business will say this, but every manager is busy. Every manager has, you know, a hundred things on their plate and they need to focus on the business. And the very first thing I say to them when they start is be selfish about your time. So 
we we are investing, I'll say to this to them, we're investing in you, but we need you to invest in yourself. And so while you're here, we want I want you to be here and I want you to be present because this this is about helping you be the best leader that you can be. And there's all kinds of people that will want to want to uh, you know get your attention and and you're going to get all kinds of emails. I know you're going to have three thousand emails in your box when you come when you when you go back. But today and tomorrow is about you. And at first, I thought it was kind of corny when I would say that. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, well, they're all going to be on their phone. I can attest that when they're in the room for those two days, they are not on their phone. Mm-hmm. And they took it, they take it seriously that the company has invested in them. And I think the other thing is the information just makes sense. You okay. know, it just is, it makes sense. Um, it's not some radical, you know, way of doing business. It just makes sense. And people can see themselves in the information that they're learning. Um, you know, from understanding their own strengths, how they how they each show up to work, um, and they have ownership to that, to then understanding how each of their employees show up to work, it just makes sense. And it's something that they can incorporate in the work that they do every day. It's not something separate. It is just all a part of how they show up to work. And so it makes sense. And that's why we can get them to pay attention to this. It's why we can get them to own their learning during boss to coach. And and it's why, you know, they show up for all the calls and why they go through all the online modules um, because it makes sense to them. And they're seeing the difference in how their teams are showing up when they apply some of these concepts. So I don't even have to sell it anymore. You know, I had to sell the boss to coach one. Um, I didn't have to sell boss to coach two to that group. And then when I, we shared the data uh, with the next cohort that went through about the difference in the engagement survey, they're all like, oh, 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 hey, well, this makes sense. And now they're calling me going, okay, what's next? I want to know what's next. What, when, when do we, when does, when do we go to Gallup again? When's our next session? You know, we're entering the busiest election cycle of a four-year election cycle starting in December. And we have all of the people that are going to go boss to coach committed to those two days. Nobody pushed back. Nobody has said, I can't make it. Nobody's made an excuse. They're going to be out of town. They are committed to being there. That says a lot for what they're learning and the difference that they feel that it's making in their job. So I don't even have to sell it anymore. You you you've already done it, and and you know you said selfish with your time, and that is so important. You know, as people and as managers, that we are selfish with our time for this development. And I, I Vicky, I just think it's inspiring that you are in that course with everybody as well, and that you're showing up with them. You know, I think that's so important from a leadership level. I mm-hmm. I'd be curious, you know, as you think about ES and S as a whole, how is your full leadership team kind of helping? It, it sounds like it's a, just a vision from the top. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Everybody's bought in. How how is that working at ESNS? Yeah. Well, um, you know, we I made a mistake a couple of, or about five years ago where we had a formal organizational development uh, group, and you know they had cl- we had classes people had to go through, and that didn't go well. So when I brought up the boss to coach, I, we did it um, organically and invited the first group to it. And, and the, and the leaders, the executive leaders were committed to it. You know, they allowed people the time to go, but the, the, the real commitment is when the leaders saw the difference in the engagement results Mm -hmm. and they saw the difference in how the managers who were going through were making different decisions about quicker decisions about performance issues and managing those people either in or out. And the executive leadership team can see that. They can see one through the data and they can see through, you know, we have lots of data we collect from turnover to, you know, involuntary versus voluntary. And the leaders can see the difference in the data that impacts our business. And 
Um, I think I told you this, you know, kiddingly, sort of kiddingly, Lauren, our CFO said to me here a couple, uh, about a month or so ago, Vicki, you have an open checkbook for however many boss to coach uh, uh, programs that you want to introduce, whatever you and Gallup want to do, you have an open checkbook. Uh, <laughs> kiddingly, but what he meant by that is I get it now. I get that it makes a difference for us. And so it's a good investment of our time and our money. To me, that's the highest praise that we can get is when a CFO opens his checkbook and says, have at it. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, no, definitely. And, and the, the coolest thing too is just how it's impacting so much more than just, you know, like, like I said, your data, but you have all these really amazing and inspiring stories to go along with that around how it's truly changing your culture and the well-being, you know, of, of people's lives. And that's, that's yes. what, that's what, you know, what wants me, that's what gets me up every day, you know, in my job <laughs> is, is for things like you're doing at ESNS. So that's amazing. You know, one of the other stories, Lauren, everybody was impacted by COVID. Everybody, every business was impacted by COVID. Us, we were impacted by COVID. And what I what I noticed is, you know, when we've come back to work, we had to run an election, a presidential election during 2020, during a COVID year. And we still had to do business. And what I noticed about our managers is that they were very um, receptive or very intuitive about how their employees were showing up to work during a very odd, unscripted time. And nobody had a book on how to, how to manage COVID and how to manage employees during COVID. Right. What I'm finding is, you know, the, as the world is coming out of COVID, I feel like COVID is so far in our rearview mirror but managers are, are really paying attention to how our employees are working. Um, you know, we haven't mandated people to come back to the building because our managers are, are really paying attention to what is happening with people when they're not coming into work and how might their behavior be changing and, you know, still managing to outcomes and, and using those conversations to drive the outcomes versus whether somebody has to show up to work or be in the office. And it's been very successful for us because it, managers have taken, taken responsibility for those conversations that they're having with employees. And I think that's minimized our impact to this thing called COVID and how, how people work, you know, worked during and after COVID. Um, I get a lot of, give a lot of credit to managers being able to, you know, uh, be adaptable to that, but it's because they were so close and in tune with their employees. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and they were able to just lead so effectively through that disruption by building those, yes. what they already had, those individualized relationships. That's such a great story. Yeah. 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 Great point. Yeah. What, and, and, you know, you're bringing up COVID. That's such a good, I mean, I, I'm glad that it's in the past, but it's such a good yeah. example of challenges that companies were really facing. And I mean, still are, you know, I mean, you referenced uh, kind of hybrid work and you haven't mandated people to come back, um, but managers are watching it and you have this culture of trust. What other type of priorities or strategies are you focusing on right now at, at ESNS? Like well-being, sense of belonging. Are there any other priorities that you're really focusing on right now? Yeah, you know, well-being is one that we have we have kind of played with a little bit, understanding that there is, you know, there are pillars or there's components of what makes up someone's, you know, whole self, not just their work self, not just their career self, but it's also, you know, the personal and social side of a person, uh, the the financial side, you know, making sure that somebody, you know, feels confident about where they, you know, they are financially. And so we're introducing, uh, we're making sure that there's conversations that are being had, managers are having. And we listen a lot to what comes out of our engagement survey. And so around this kind of the social well-being, what our employees are saying is, hey, we would like to have a little bit more fun at work. We would like to be able to socialize with our colleagues. We would like to be able to, you know, 
have more, uh, you know, get togethers. So we're talking with managers about paying attention to that sort of data and figuring out how they, how they, they include that in the work. How do you include fun in the work? How do you include the ability for people to socialize in the work? Um, especially if your team works remote, what do you do? Let's talk about opportunities and possibilities of how you do that. And so um, while we don't have a formal well-being program, we're using you know, the information that we're getting out of our engagement survey to address those you know, those, those specific, you know, issues about things outside of work more than just the work person. That's amazing. And it, it, exactly more than the work person, you know, we're all human. Uh, how can we bring some of those elements into our day today? I, I like the reference of fun and, you know, it's, it's back to like our approach to engagement, you know, having a best friend at work, it is so important because it does help with retention. So uh, yes. I love that example. That's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. And I think Lauren, to your, your point, it isn't just for the, for the sake of fun to have fun, that there is a business side to it, that it's really tied to our business. Um, we, have, we have had this even before I came in, but we have our four key business results. And the first key business result is employee engagement satisfaction. And our CEO, every October and November, talks for an hour and a half about what we're learning from our engagement survey. What are the things from the, the results from the comments that we're hearing that are important to people? And what, what, what we're seeing is that is one of the most important meetings for people because they wanna come and hear about not just the business side, but the culture side. And our CEO ties that culture side to the business because the next KPI is, is um, improved uh, product quality and value, which ties to customer engagement and satisfaction, which ties to increase business um, uh, um, financial growth and um, profits. So, you know, that it's something we've always had. We take each of those elements and break down what does it mean, but at the end, it's all tied to having a better business, making more money. And all of our employees um, are aware of that. Yeah, definitely. And, and even hearing that too, Vicki, I, culture shock. I know you and I have talked a little bit about Art Gallup's new book, Culture Shock. Yeah, yeah. Four of those kind of key components that we're seeing that people are really, and organizations are really looking for um, in the workplace today, one of them includes that focus of customer centricity and are really kind of thinking through how can we as an organization show up more effectively for our customers? So I love that you're making that, that reference point too, and that that's Again, you know, what this is all about is we want our employee experience to be fueled, but also how is that driving our customer experience um, at the end of the day? And it sounds like a lot of this is doing just that for you at ESNS. Yeah. And, you know, one of the other, to that point, Lauren, one of the, you know, going back to uh, ensuring that our managers are having meaningful conversations with each employee, part of that focus we talk a lot about is tying the work to the customer. You know, and our customer, we have multiple customers, we, you know, whether it's the voter or whether it's the election official or whether it's the secretary of state, we have lots of different customers, you know, but we have some people like in our finance department that never see a customer, but the managers tie the work that our finance, our finance group is doing, to, you know, to collecting, you know, collecting um, outstanding invoices. Uh, to making sure that the customer is getting an invoice in which they can understand. And so each manager is, you know, in a, in a customer facing role, it's e very easy to tie your, you know, connection to the customer. But to those that are not direct customer facing, we still want to tie what an individual has impact to our customer. And we're finding that to be very effective, again, through our key business results, but making that part of the meaningful conversations that managers are having. Oh yeah, definitely. That's amazing that that's part of the, the meaningful conversation. And just again, you know, singing culture shock, it's one meaningful conversation per week that employees need. And if you can infuse those connections to culture, 
in that that's going to be such you know such a valuable conversation yeah we uh, we um again data nerds we collect that data in our engagement survey and last year about having me i had one meaningful conversation with my manager we say per month or uh, every other week okay. um we went from 85% in 2022 to people saying yes absolutely yes to 95% of our employees this year said absolutely yes am i wow. having a meaningful conversation with my manager wow. i i it, and a, it, a lot of it just ha i think a lot of it has to do with boss to coach too we're teaching them how to have those meaningful conversations absolutely that is that again those those sorts of comments just give me chills because that's amazing you know that we're thinking about employees at ESNS are able to really show up and you know for one they're the talent fit to your culture and for two they're able to show up and do what they do best every day through that lens of their strengths yeah and then for three they have a manager that's engaging them and having these meaningful conversations that are inspiring them um it's so exciting and and vicky i love i know we only have a few minutes left here but i just would love for you to share with the with the audience what are ESNS's next like top priorities? You have your futuristic really high, so this might really you might love this question. <laughs> oh, I don't but, know, Lauren. I'm not no, sure. No. Yeah, you have no idea. <laughs> I have no uh, idea. No, <laughs> great, great point. We have two really important um, things that we need to pay attention to. So, real quickly, you know, the election industry hasn't changed a lot. You know, people are still voting on paper. Uh, you know, we still have some of the same equipment we did 30 years ago. But what we're finding is, you know, as the new generations are coming in, the desire for more technology is going to increase. Right. You know, instead of changing election equipment every 10 to 15 years, we think that it's, you know, in the next seven to 10 years, they're going to be, they're going to, we're going to vote differently. I don't know that we're going to vote on our phone, but we're going to vote differently. And so the need for making sure that we are um, upskilling our employees, being able to be ready when, you know, the technology needs or customers require that technology to change and being very mindful about what the need of the, of the future employee is going to be. That's number one focus. Number two focus is again data. Um, our average age here at ESNS is 49 years old, which means in the next you know five to ten years we're going to have a big retirement party. We're going to have lots of people that are going to be entering that stage of wanting to, you know to go run off in the sunset and do other things. So we need to be developing our top leaders today um, and beginning begin to identify who those are and be very intentional about their experiences and making sure that they're ready. So those are our two top initiatives that we're paying attention to um, in the next two to three years. Wow. Really important initiatives, you know, succession planning and uh, yeah. everything that you're doing right now is tied so strongly to that to really set your future up for success. So, um, yes. I, and Jim, I, it looks like you might have a question here. Well, I just want to say, you know, I love hearing all this data. I get questions from the community all the time of, hey, we're doing these initiatives. H how do we know we're doing them well? And, uh, you know, and I love the fact that you're taking the opportunity to ask the questions like, are, are these meaningful conversations actually happening? <laughs> like, you know, what, what a great way, uh, you know, you can, you can only, you know, you, you've got to measure that in some way. And, yeah. It's not rocket science. It's just ask the question, <laughs> yeah. is it happening, right? Are these mm -hmm. kinds of things happening? And so mm -hmm. super great to hear, you know, and it, it would make sense as a, as a voting company, you'd be data nerds, right? Because it's 100% <laughs> data yeah. right, in what you're yeah. doing there. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. just, just great, to, great to hear that. Um, Lauren, we are at the top of our time here. Can you, yes. can you take a second? Would you thank Vicki for being here? Oh, of course. Yeah, no, Vicki, thank you. Thank you so much for, for one, for your partnership. I always love our conversations and working with you. And thank you for the great dialogue today and conversation. I, I think the work that you're doing at ESNS is inspiring and impactful, and it's making a difference on the community and your employees. So I'm just excited for all that's ahead in the future, and I can't thank you enough. 
Excellent. Thank you, Lauren. And thanks, Jim. Thanks. You know, I, I don't think about all these successes until you have this articulated. And, and I think back and go, wow, we really have come a long ways. That's so thank you. It's you why we know. put these together because it's a great <laughs> opportunity to get that done. And um, I, listen, I, it, one, it's great to see you again. Uh, I, I've been around long enough to remember your time here. But but two, super proud that ES Nest is here in Omaha and that we are at the yes. center of that when we think about voting and democracy and all those things that, that yes. go into that super important uh, work that is done there. And so mm-hmm. just super proud that uh, yeah. that you guys call Omaha your home and, uh, and, and that you're a part of the Omaha community. So thanks again. Excellent. Thank Absolutely. you, Jim. With that, we'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we have available, my.gallup.com. There were some questions um, or earlier about talent-based hiring or boss to coach. If you're interested in more information about that, we've got some information on our websites, but it might just be easier for you to contact us. Send us an email, coaching at gallop.com. We'll get somebody to call you back and, and work you through that. We are getting ready. I know it sounds kind of weird, but uh, the summer of 2024, June 2024, will be here before you know it. The Gallup at Work Summit is is on and the planning is all in. We'd love for you to be there. Head out to Gallup at Work, all one word, dot com get more information about that. We'd love to have you join us here, especially if you're in the Omaha area and stay up to date on all the future webcasts uh, by joining us in our Facebook group or LinkedIn. We post when we're going live over there. And of course you can find all things uh, strengths by searching Clifton strengths on any social, uh, on any of the social um, sites. Thanks for listening. If you found this useful, we'd ask that you'd share it. And with that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.